I wish I knew as much about the book of Job as Wendell says that I do, frankly. <clears throat> this is a great audience. When you consider the condition of the roads, and if you listen to the news this morning, you were warned time and time again to do nothing except stay in and watch television. I do hope this will be better than that. We're glad that you're here. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be on this program again, and I'm especially grateful for the opportunity of speaking from the book of Job. Job is a unique book. It's different from all the others. There's not another book in the Bible with, with which we can compare the book of Job. It's not a part of the continuing story of God's unfolding of his great scheme of redemption and that it fits in historically. It's a book concerning a man and the life that helps us all from the viewpoint of somewhere in history, we don't know where, wrestling with problems that we do know about and much, much help for us in times of trouble. It's a unique book in that much of it is uninspired. In fact, a great deal of it is wrong. Now, I'll tell your attention by that statement, so I'll tell you what I mean. It is an account of what uninspired men had to say. When inspiration gives us a quotation from an uninspired man, the Bible is responsible for the accuracy of the quotation, but not for the truthfulness of it. For instance, when the Bible says that the devil said, you shall not die, the devil told a lie. But the Bible gives us an accurate quotation of the lie that the devil told. We have an inspired account of the philosophy of some uninspired men when we read the book of Job. Much of it is composed of the speeches of Eliphaz and Bildad and Zophar and Elihu. Even Job himself leads us to wonder, was Job himself inspired? He said some things that, it seems like God had to speak to him first. And then on the other hand, he too believed in the theory of retribution and other things that he surely did not learn from inspiration. R.L. Whiteside made an unusual statement. He said Job must have had some degree of inspiration. Now that's interesting, isn't it? We don't know how much. We do not know especially uh, what philosophies of Job he did learn from man, or maybe God had spoken to him on some occasions. But be that as it may, the book is largely composed of the speeches of men who came to Job to try to comfort him, and they said all that human wisdom knows about human suffering. That is human wisdom unsupported by God's word. The book of Job may have been the first book of the Bible written, it does deal with one of man's most perplexing problems. Why do righteous people suffer? We're supposed to, in our study today, have an overview of the book of Job first. And when we see that and some of the principles of interpretation, we will have largely answered the problems in these problem passages. Wonder what time am I supposed to quit? All right. Uh, the book of Job is really a great drama. The main characters are God and Satan and Job. The first th two chapters give us the setting of this drama. The sons of men were coming to present themselves before the Lord, and the devil came among them. And God saw him there and asked him about where he'd been, what he was doing. And then God introduced a subject that sets in motion the book that we're talking about today. He said, have you considered my servant Job? And God described him as being a perfect and upright man, one that feared God and eschewed evil. The old devil said, yeah, yeah, I, I, I've noticed that. But he's not serving you for nothing. He's serving you for what he can get out of it. Now, I understand we're supposed to be using the King James or the American Standard Translations, but I've got to use a Hamilton paraphrase on this. If you'll let me tell this story in my own words, I think we can picture it very accurately. God said concerning Job, 
Satan, here is a man that I can trust. Here is a man that is a man of integrity. Here is a man who serves me. The devil propounded his philosophy. He said, but he's only doing it for what he can get out of it. That had God on the spot, as it were. The old devil was taking the position that man whom God had created would only serve God because God would give him things. He was buying his love, as it were. And God was ready to put him to the test. He had to use Job in order to do it. So he said to Satan, you can do anything you want to to him. I'll give you the power to do that, except don't touch his life. And it was then that Satan began to afflict Job. His children were all killed. All of his possessions were taken from him. And uh, Job had major problems. He began to react in a beautiful way. He threw dust on his head. He tore his clothing. He went to worship. He said, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In other words, I didn't have anything before I got here. I will not have anything after I leave. And while I'm here, it all belongs to God anyway. If he wants to take it back, let him have it. Well, that was the very thing the devil didn't want to see. The second scene is like the first. When Satan came to pre uh, when the sons of men came to present themselves before God again, Satan came back, and God brought up this subject. He had the devil on the spot this time. He said, if you consider my servant Job, the old devil had to do something. And he said, yeah, I know, but if it's because you built a fence around him. You let me uh, cause him to suffer. And God said, don't take his life, but I'll let you do anything else to him that you want to. It was then that he broke out in balls from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. Now you can read a lot of commentaries, and they'll try to give you a medical diagnosis of what was wrong with Job. I don't know what the doctors would have said, but so far as I'm concerned, the balls are good enough. No doubt he is wanting to inflict pain, and there's nothing that can hurt worse than one little tiny ball. You get them from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet, and I'll challenge anybody to come up with an idea that would indicate greater pain than that. He got sick, hurting, suffering. The wife said, why don't you curse God and die? Friends came to see him, and they didn't perform so well themselves. They made matters worse. The old devil did everything he could in order to break Job's spirit and get him to curse God. Job remained a man of integrity. Sometimes he wondered. Sometimes he questioned. Sometimes he, uh, he, he just couldn't understand it all. But he always trusted the Lord. Now that is really the drama in the book. While he was that way, I think that he suffered more than usually we give him credit for. The old devil brought just about every, every problem to Job that he could bring to him or upon him. First of all, he was bereaved. But you know what kind of bereavement he had? He had ten children. And he was a kind of a doting parent. Uh, he, he was always arranging for these children, it seems, to be together when they have a birthday or something. And incidentally, it was a close-knit family because the boys even included their sisters. And back in that day, that didn't often happen. But uh, the family would get together, and Job would make sacrifices for them. But a great tragedy came, and all ten of those children were killed at one time. Immediately after that, he had bankruptcy. Job was a wealthy man. But one messenger after another came, and everything that he had had been wiped out in one day. No insurance, not even a homeowner's policy. The government didn't have a low interest rate loan for him to get back in business again. It was a total loss. The only thing he had left was a wife. And no doubt the devil would have taken her. And he had a way that she could hurt Job worse than that would have. Just wait a while, you know, we'll see. And then these three messengers that came and somebody had to bring the message to him. That was the only thing that he had left. Bereavement, bankruptcy, 
And uh, that didn't happen just for a while. It was prolonged agony. He said on one occasion, months of weariness. Uh, he was in intense pain. He thought that death was imminent. He said, the grave is ready for me. He had this unsupportive wife who said, why don't you curse God and die? I'm persuaded that she was trying to help him, but she didn't know how. He said she spoke as one of the foolish women did. His friends came to see him. That was good. You know, those friends must have come somewhere between four and 800 miles to visit Job. And likely they rode a camel. Now, I've ridden a camel, but I don't want to ride one 800 miles, I tell you. I can't imagine a more miserable way of transportation, assuming that's the way they did come, or if they walked, or what have you. It was a long journey. And no doubt when Job saw them coming, he said, Ah, oh, here's somebody that can understand. But when they found him, he was so emaciated, so uh, in such terrible pain, in such a terrible condition, sitting there in a pile of ashes, scraping his sores with a piece of broken pottery. Bible describes those sores as, uh, well, in, in one instance, it said, I'm clothed with worms and clods of dust. Might have been running sores. You just can't imagine anything worse. And there he was, grieving, broke, friendless, lonely. Those friends sat there and looked at him seven days. Now, can you imagine a visit like that? People don't do that anymore, but sometimes it seems like they stayed seven days, you know. There they sat seven days, and then when they began to speak, it got worse. They had a religious philosophy that said that if a man suffered, it was because of some bad thing that he had done, and they began to accuse him. He began to deny it, and they would accuse him more sharply. He would deny it. And uh, there were three cycles of speeches here. Eliphaz would speak first, and Job would reply to that. Then Bildad would speak, and Job would reply to that speech, and then Zophar would speak, he'd reply to that. And then they went over that the second time and started for the third round. If you'll follow the discussion very carefully, you'll find it just about like most arguments. They pick up steam as they go along. Uh, Eliphaz started by hinting, uh, rather subtly, Job, we thought you were a good guy. But you must have been a terribly bad person to be suffering like this. Well, he was frustrated. He didn't know what to think, but he denied it. And then when Bildad spoke, he was more intense, more, uh, more certain that Job must have sinned greatly. And on and on it went. You did too, I didn't either. You did too, I didn't either. You did too, I didn't either. You know, the way those things build up. But anyway, finally, in this third round or cycle of controversy, Bildad made a very, very short speech. And so far, didn't speak at all. That indicates maybe they were out of soap. They said everything they knew to say. Job denied everything they were saying. He didn't convince them. They didn't convince him. There was a young man by the name of Elihu there listening to all of it. He stayed quiet as long as he could. And then he spoke, but he didn't help matters a bit. After that was all over, Job, as he had consistently done, wanted to talk to God about it. And finally, God appeared to him in a whirlwind, called him on the carpet, as it were, began to discuss the matter with him, asked him questions that uh, he could not answer. And finally, Job broke down and confessed that even though he had heard of God, now he had seen him, and how sorry he was, how he had repented. And uh, then God blessed him abundantly. That briefly, of course, is an overview of the book itself. Now, if we understand this, we're going to have to understand the purpose for which the book of Job was written. And right here is where I part company with most of the uh, common uh, terries that uh, I've checked. Almost of that exception, they will give one purpose for which the book of Job was written, and then their view of the book will be centered around that. But where do we get the idea that God only had one purpose in mind for writing the book or having the book? Uh, written for us. Could there not be several reasons that God had the book of Job placed in the Bible? Why would we limit God to just one thing that he was trying to accomplish? I'd like to suggest to you today that there likely were several reasons why the book of Job was written. Number one, it deals with the question, will a man serve God for nothing? 
Now that was the very basis of the of the drama that occurred here in the first two chapters. The devil was accusing Job, and if he would accuse the very best man in the world, certainly in principle it would apply to any other. Will a man serve God for nothing? Will he serve God uh, unless he gets something out of it? This may be getting close to where we're doing some preaching. Haven't you heard or have you not preached that the more we do for the Lord, the more he will bless us? Haven't you used such passages as give and it will be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will men give in your bosom? And apply it to giving? I believe it applies. I think that's right. Over in 2 Corinthians, the uh, ninth chapter, uh, the uh, discussion there that Paul uh, had with the church at Corinth about the fact the more we give, the more we have. Or go back to Malachi and talk about God's promise there. Why, well, surely so. And the Bible teaches these things. That if we serve God, that he will be good to us. The children of Israel especially had that promise spelled out for them. When God promised them that if they would obey him, there are certain things of a physical nature that he would do for them. The Bible teaches that. And yet here the devil challenged God on that very basis of our being faithful to our maker. The truth, I think, is easy to see. God's blessings to those who serve him come as a fruit of that devotion and dedication and not as a motive for it. If we're serving God because of what we get out of it, then that motive destroys the very dedication that we need to have for the Lord. But if with a proper motive we serve God and with enough integrity of character to say, I'm going to do what God wants me to do regardless, like Job said in Job 13 and 15. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And if we serve God from that motive, then the Lord is going to open the windows of heaven and give us more blessings than we're able to receive. But that is the fruit of our dedication and not the motive for it. The old devil was making that the motive that man used to serve God. And he, uh, uh, God, he mentioned Job. That would do as good as any. He said the only reason in the world that Job is your servant is because of what all you've done for him. Look, how, look, look what a man he is, a respected elder of the city, uh, what the wealthiest man in all the East. Good health, good family, ten children, everything a person could want. Why, sure, he's serving you, but because of what he's getting out of it, that is where God put Job to the test and incidentally staked his entire integrity upon the character of this man. And God, through Job, won the discussion with Satan. All right, the, Bible, the book of Job teaches us, I think, that man can serve God out of a sense of integrity. It enables us to know that we can do right if we want to, regardless of what happens. That's one of the greatest encouragements to any of us as we try to live for the Lord. Another reason that the book of Job is in the Bible is to teach us the fallacy of the theory of retribution. Now, this was a very widely held doctrine in that day, and unfortunately still is. But back then especially, it seemed like nearly everybody believed this old theory of retribution, which simply means that all the suffering a person endures is proportionate to and the result of some sin that he has committed. That's why they had the discussion here between Job and his friends. That was where the problem area was. Job and his friends believed in that. And when the friends saw Job in that kind of a condition, they began to reason from uh, effect back to cause, and they said, well, this man must be terribly wicked to be suffering like this. That's what frustrated Job. He knew how he was suffering. He knew that he was innocent, and it just didn't add up. Incidentally, I think one of the ways that Job suffered was one of his favorite religious dogmas proved to be wrong. You know, when we have difficulty... We plant our feet on our faith in God's word. And if we've misunderstood some basic 
principle of the Bible, and that we see that that understanding has been wrong, that can be a terrible hindrance, can't it? Well, one of Job's favorite religious doctrines had proved to be wrong. The theory of retribution was not right. All suffering does not come directly as a result of and proportionate to the sins that some person has committed. God wanted us to know that that doctrine wasn't right. And so the book of Job emphasizes that great truth. I don't have a bit of difficulty believing that's one of the purposes of the book of Job. Why, when some religious error becomes widespread, we preachers will preach a series of sermons showing what's wrong with it. Here's a widespread religious error. Would not God place one book in the Bible to show that it's not right? Especially when it's so basic as that old theory of, re of retribution. That didn't cure it. It's still around today. It was still around in Jesus' day. You know, one time the disciples asked Jesus about this. And again, let me use that Hamilton paraphrase. He said, why, there's a cold spell that's engulfed the nation and 65 people have died. Does that mean they're greater sinners than those that didn't die? Well, he used one of their examples of the Tower of Siloam falling upon some people in Luke 13. Same argument exactly. He said, are those people that died when the tower fell on them greater sinners than the ones that didn't? I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you'll all likewise perish. The disciples saw a man born blind one time, and they said, hey, Master, who's sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? That was a problem if one believed that theory, wasn't it? And Jesus pointed out that neither, the purpose of something else. Over on the island of Malta, in Acts 28, when Paul and his companions were shipwrecked, and uh, they got on shore, and Paul was picking up sticks to throw on that fire that they might dry and warm by it. A viper came out and fastened on his hands. Those barbarians, the natives there, said, this man's guilty. He escaped the gods of the sea, but now he's still going to get it, you see. They believed in that theory of retribution. They believed in that blind faith. The book of Job teaches that that's not so. And makes it very evident, very plain, that the theory of retribution is not true. Now, sometimes people swing from one extreme to the other. And if all of our suffering does not come as a result of our sins, they, they assume that none of it does. That's wrong, too. great deal of the suffering that comes to us is a result of our own sins. You eliminate all the human suffering that comes as a result of the sins that people commit, you've greatly relieved the problem of its mystery. So he disproved the theory of retribution. Another purpose of the book was to show us that we can trust God even though we don't always have an answer to all of our questions nor a solution to all of our problems. Why did this have to happen to me? Why me? Why did this have to happen? Why did it have to happen like it did? We don't always know. We go through some difficult days. But I'll tell you one thing, if we're acquainted with Job, we can know that we can trust God and hold on to him even though we do not understand why we have some of the problems that we do. And that it pays to continue to trust God and live for him. Why did this have to happen? I don't know. But it doesn't make any difference. If we know the who... We can endure the what, no matter the why. The book of Job teaches us that. And another thing the book of Job teaches us, and I think one of the purposes of its being in the Bible, is that the final result for those righteous who endure is final victory. John, uh, James 5 and verse 11 points out that. You've seen the end of the Lord, that he is pitiful and of tender mercy, and he used the patience of Job as a result. Now, we can trust God while we go through these stages because we know that someday it's going to turn out all right. Somebody says, well, what if I die in the meantime? Well, who says we've got to live? You know we're going to die anyway. Why should we be so negative about death? We don't even like to talk about death. We change the name. We talk about passing away or going on out or... Uh, falling asleep or something like that. 
Why not talk about death? We don't need to be negative about it. I read the other day of a hospital that started writing up their death cases as negative patient care results. It seems like everybody wants to be negative about this matter of death. It's a part of that. We're not here forever. We're going to die someday. It's not a matter of if. It's a matter of when. Okay, so we have the trouble. All right, we don't live through it. We die in the middle of it. But there's something better. Jesus said, if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm going to come again and receive you to myself to where I am. There you may be also. You know, the book of Revelation really carries the same message in the New Testament. We may lose a few battles, but we'll win the war if we remain faithful to the Lord. And that's what the book of Job teaches and what it taught in the long ago. And then another purpose for the book is that God still cares irregardless of what we're enduring. We may think that he doesn't, but God still knows about it, and he's still concerned. That bothered Job. I'd like to have time to discuss it longer, but there's too many things that need to be said. Finally, as to the reason, the purpose of the book, it provides some light, though not a comprehensive answer, to the question of human suffering. Job discusses a question it does not answer. Why do the righteous people suffer? It gives us a lot of insight uh, to that reason, and yet it never fully answers the question, why the righteous people suffer. All that human philosophy can devise was said by these friends of Job, and we know that if one holds on to the Lord during problem times like this, that he is going to be victorious. We know that God cares, that God is concerned. The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. His ears are open into their prayers. But why it has to happen, the book of Job, nowhere in the Bible, are we definitely told. In order to understand the book of Job, we have to be able to view it like Job viewed it. Now, that's not easy. Job lived a long time ago, and he was going through this endurance not knowing the background. We have two things that Job didn't have. Number one, we have the book of Job. If he could have read the first two chapters of this book, it was, his life would have been totally different from what it was. There he was wondering why this has to happen. He was suffering. He did not understand it. He prayed to God. He thought God didn't hear. He did not know about the conversation between God and Satan. Now, we, we know why this happened. Job didn't. Another thing, we have the New Testament. We have a tendency to read the book of Job and try to understand it through the eyes of Calvary. Job didn't know about the things that we know in the New Testament. In fact, Job cried out. He had many questions, and most of them are answered by Jesus Christ. For instance, in Job 9 and verse 33, he said, Oh, that I had an umpire that might lay his hands upon us both. He wanted somebody that could understand him and that could understand God and that could be a go-between there. In 1 Timothy 2 and 6, there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He can reach up to God with his great arm of deity, reach down to man with his hand of humanity. He can stand between the two. And we have that umpire that Job wanted. He didn't have it. And we try to understand his problems, knowing that we do have that mediator. Again, Job wanted to know if there was life beyond. And in Job 14, 14, he said, If a man die, shall he live again? No question he had some sort of an inkling of an idea that there was something out there. But he didn't know it like we do. Paul said to Timothy that life and immortality has been brought to light through the gospel. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that liveth and believeth in me will never die. He said, I'm going to come again and receive you unto myself. In Jesus, we have the answer to Job's question. If a man dies, shall he live again? Job wanted to see God in Job 23. Cried out if he could just see it. John 14 and 9, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We can see God in the person of Jesus Christ. We can see human wisdom 
and human power and uh, uh, all of the attributes of God demonstrated in human terms by looking at Jesus, who was God manifest in the flesh. Job cried out for God to hear him. He thought God didn't. But Jesus said, that whatsoever you ask, you know, he gave us that promise. The eyes of the Lord are open, uh, uh, his ears are open into their prayers. Job did not know how to evaluate himself. He had a low self-image. American Standard Version in Job 40 and verse 4, Job said, I am a small account. And I tell you, if there's one thing we need to be helping the people do today, it's to recognize that they are worth more than many people realize that they are. How many psychological problems are plaguing people now because of that low self-image? And it's hard to convince them sometimes that God doesn't make junk. God made us. We're the product of his hands. And Jesus himself said, here's Jesus answering Job's question again, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? If you put the whole world on one side of the balance and put the soul of the lowest person on earth on the other, it's worth more than all the wealth of the world. If people recognize that, we'd have a lot less trouble. Job had a lot of questions. Jesus answered them for us. And we've got to study the book of Job as though we were back there with him. To really understand it, we need to understand the kind of a man he was. His religious philosophy that said, Job, uh, you uh, know that uh, uh, people suffer because of some sin they've committed, and yet he knew he had not sinned. Therefore, we need to see his frustration. Well, now, that's the introduction. Let's preach a sermon here. There's some difficult passages. Most of these have been answered by this overview of the book. In Job 1, in verse 12, in Job 2 and 6, was God right in uh, merciful in permitting Satan's request? Well, we tried to see that God needed to demonstrate to the devil the integrity of man, that man can and often will serve God simply because God is God and out of a sense of right, whether it gets anything out of it or not. Man is God's creation, and man is to glorify God. That's our purpose here. And if we've got to get paid to do it, well, then there's something wrong with God's plan. That's what the devil said. But God said man doesn't have to be paid to serve me. Look at Job. Do anything to him you want to, and believe me, the devil threw the book at him. And Job maintained his integrity through it all. He proved that man can serve God and uh, at the same time do it because of that sense of integrity. God has often allowed the innocent to suffer for the guilty. Had he not, then we'd all be lost in sin today. Consider the suffering of Jesus. Then in Job 40 and verse 8, God asked Job, Will thou also disannul my judgments? Will thou condemn me that thou mayest be righteous? We better let God take care of God th God's things and let us take care of the things of man. Another difficulty in Job 7, verses 8 through 10, going down to the grave and coming up no more, dying and wasting, lying down and rising not. Now the materialists use that to prove that there's nothing after this life is over. And they'll quote the passages here from Job 7 and also in the 14th chapter of Job, but they don't do their homework well. There in Job 7, the eye of him that hath seen me shall see me no more. And eyes are upon me, and I am not. The cloud is consumed and vanishes away. He shall return no more to his house, neither shall his place know him any more. Job is wrestling with this matter of life and death, life here on earth. He's not talking about the hereafter. He's talking about the here. And he says when a man dies, he's not going to return to his own place. The ones who won't see him are the ones that know him. Death ends the relationships of this world, and that's what Job's wrestling with. Job, who was an uninspired man, and uh, at least not uh, inspired in the sense that others have been, was wrestling with the idea of what this is all about. And all he could see was this life only. And death would end this existence as we know it. He was not talking about a resurrection and an afterlife. Those that have seen me shall see me no more. 
he'll return no more to his house, not dealing with death and thereafter. Another difficult passage is in Job 19 and verse 25, the Redeemer standing upon the earth in the latter day. Now the premillennialists obviously use this to prove that Jesus is going to come back, come back to earth and establish his kingdom. Again, they haven't read the passages carefully. You need to know, see the development of Job's ideas here and all the frustration of uh, knowing he was innocent, yet suffering so. His friend sitting there trying to tell him he was guilty, trying to convince him he was. He was arguing back with him. And in the ninth chapter, he said, I wish I had that mediator between the two of us. In the 13th chapter, he was speaking again, and he shows that he's, well, maybe there is one, looking for one. In the 16th chapter, he talks about having a heavenly witness. He's developing this idea that there is somebody that can stand between man and God. And in Job 19, he was sure of his Redeemer. And he said, in the latter day, my Redeemer is going to come. I think of Jesus as a Redeemer the first time he came, don't you? He's coming back as a judge. And the Redeemer did come to earth. The Redeemer did stand upon the earth and make atonement for the sins of all those who will follow him. So we need to consider the fact that he's the Redeemer, that he came, fulfill the yearning of Job's heart, for one to stand between man and God. And then in Job 25 and verse 4, how can he be clean that is born of a woman? The advocates of the theory of hereditary total depravity have a field day with this one. I don't know why. This is a statement made by the uninspired Bildad to try to convince Job that he was guilty, and one evidence was, you were born of a woman, weren't you? Therefore, you've got to be guilty. And that was a short speech when Job was winding down the controversy, or when the friends were. So if a person is so hard-pressed for a proof text, that they have to find a statement of an uninspired man losing an argument to take it out of his context and apply it to something else. Well, you can make your own judgment concerning their problem. The other problem passages in the book of Job, like there are in all books. But I tell you what, if we will consider the purposes for which the book of Job was written, the drama there that is being enacted, and know that God is being put to the test by Satan by saying that your creation is not honoring you. Your creation is simply doing what they're doing because of what you're doing for them. And God allowed that doctrine to be tested and proved forever wrong. We begin to appreciate Job more than ever. I don't believe there's anybody except Jesus Christ himself that can be of greater help and comfort to us and the problems of life and can Job. God allowed him to endure all of this for a while in order that he can tell us, you're going to have some dark days, you're going to have some problems, you're going to have some questions for which there's no answer, you're not going to be able to understand some of your experiences in life. But remember, Job trusted me, and he came out all right. And we serve the same God today that Job did. We've got the same assurance that all will be well with us as was demonstrated in the life of my friend Job. Thank you.